from last week. There is no, uh, we, we ended with this uh, kind of for the ones who are here, uh, the first part of, of chapter 7, that there's no quicker way to be called a heretic than to call someone out on their own spiritual hypocrisy. When we see spiritual hypocrisy in someone, we're automatically, they're going to want to call us a heretic. And, and, and last week we discussed just a little bit at the very end that most arguments uh, regarding religion are based on preferences and not really on the Word of God. If you find a lot of arguing and people arguing about God, it's more about traditions and preferences than it is really about the Word. Because, I mean, we can look at the Scriptures and we can kind of see some different things sometimes, and we, and we can do that. But a lot of times, our view of the Scriptures is based on our preferences. It's based on what we've seen or haven't seen. Um... Uh, that some would that would come from a a uh, a more full gospel, charismatic Pentecostal kind of kind of bent would be accused of of preaching and believing and teaching based on experience more than on the Word of God, and and sometimes that that happens. But I would also tell you that we got to be careful, just in the same way that just because we haven't experienced something and yet it's in the Word of God that we dismiss it because we've never experienced it. And you see that a lot uh, in, in different, different kind of arguments, and sometimes it's based on style and preferences and not really, well, this is what God says, so are we lining up with God's Word or not? And there's a lot of arguments that are there. I had to, uh, not with an argument, but I actually received an, an email from a, a, a Brian student that I don't know uh, that, uh, that needed... Uh, needed the opinion, needed the wording, needed the questioning of someone from outside their denomination, which that's, that's fantastic. I don't know what they are, and I don't know why they think that I'm not whatever they are. But anyhow, so they, so they sent, sent me. I didn't know this girl. And she sent I was like, yeah, sure, I'll answer some questions. So the other day, of course, she sent it very diligently. It was, it was due very diligently, and I need this back. And I was like, yeah, I'll answer the questions. Well, I get an email today and say, hey, that's due tomorrow. I really need those tonight. And, of course, I'd forgotten to answer the questions. But it was great. And so I was able to answer questions, but it was all about uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of what is our tradition. And it was based on, like, the liturgical uh, calendar. It was based on, on uh, there's, a, there's another name for it. Basically, we follow, there's, there's different things. Easter and Christmas are those, but there's Advent, there's Lent, there's other things like that. And so the questions was, do we follow that? Do, do we think that's weird? Do we think it's okay? Do, whatever. And so I tried to answer, and it was totally not argumentative at all. She just kind of wanted to know for, for whatever paper it was. And, and, um, and I just talked a little bit about my tradition and bringing up and how I'm familiar with it, but I don't know all of it. I know it from... I remember the first time that I ever heard someone say something about Monday, Thursday. And for those of you that come from a a different background than I do, may know what Maundy Thursday is, and it's, it's M, uh, M-A-U-N-D-Y, I think it is, maybe O-U, but I think it's A-U. Maundy Thursday is the Thursday before the crucifixion, before Easter, okay? So it's the Thursday before Good Friday, Maundy Thursday. And I remember I was in a ministerial association meeting, uh, which which sometimes are great and sometimes you'll never get that time back. But anyhow, I was, uh, I was in this meeting, we are sitting around, and they said, well, of course... We, of course, we've got to discuss. We've, we've got to discuss. I just knocked that off. We've got to discuss Mon- Monday, Thursday, and they're all talking. Well, of course, yeah. Well, we got to discuss Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday is important. We got to talk about Monday, Thursday. Are we doing anything for Monday the Thursday? And and, I, and I'm sitting there, and then me and this other guy, he's like from. He, I mean, he's he he like he is. I love this guy, but he was like out there. I mean, he was like crazy. He had long, like, you know, Nazarene hair. Like he had taken a vow not to cut his hair, and it was long. And, and not really, but that was the joke. And, and he was like crazy. He was this rock guitar kind of guy. And he's sitting there, and he's looking at me. And, I, and I'm like, I don't know, man. I, you know, he always look at me. And so finally I was like, what are we doing Monday through Thursday? <laughs> Cause I don't, I don't, I don't understand what we're doing. I don't, I don't remember ever doing it. And they all kind of looked at me. They were like, "Oh, Bobby," and then they just went on. And I figured out later, later it was this kind of liturgical kind of thing. And it's cool. And it's fine. It's great. But it's just, it just wasn't my tradition. It wasn't. I didn't grow up following a, a calendar. Uh, uh, a couple years ago, uh, me and the, the family we kind of did an Advent thing. 
but it wasn't really kind of, it was Advent light, Advent ish. And it was just, we kind of did a devotion each week. We got this each night and kind of just led up. And I guess really the purpose of Advent is kind of leading you up and, and remembering and knowing and that kind of thing. And, but it was just, it was just interesting. So you know, she was asking these questions, and I was trying to sound intelligent and answer the questions in a few moments. But I, but I found, again, most arguments and, and most uh, things where we say, well, you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong, is more based on preferences than it's really based on the Word of God. And there's nothing wrong with preferences. But just when you get into where you're dismissing what someone else has done, and we've kind of talked about that, how we, we tend to pick and choose what's important rather than focus on what God says is important, that somebody can have a different experience but yet can have a different story but have a similar experience and their walk with God doesn't have to look like yours necessarily and you can come to the same place with God and it doesn't mean every road leads to God but it means you got to figure out what matters and who is Jesus and what does he mean and is he the only way to the Father and if you want to do that and if you want to understand Jesus and and you give your heart to him and ask for forgiveness, it's the only way the Father. But if in your worship, if you want to sing a chorus and raise your hand, or if you want to follow a responsive reading and a calendar, who's to say? And so we get into arguments over these kind of things. And so that's kind of where it kind of ended up. So the question is, does it matter? Does it change who Jesus is? And does it change that he is the only way to be saved? And if not, it's just kind of an argument sometimes. In John seven twenty five. After that, some of the people who lived in Jerusalem started to ask each other, Isn't this the man they're trying to kill? But here he is, speaking in public. And they say nothing to him. <clears throat> could our leaders possibly believe that he is the Messiah? But how could he be? For we know that where this man comes from. And when the Messiah comes, <clears throat> it's fine. he'll simply appear. Like out of nowhere. It'll be great. He'll simply appear. No one will know where he comes from. That was kind of their discussion. Uh, I'll say this. <clears throat> Sometimes people get messed up uh, and, and they kind of have an idea of some things. But we'll talk about that in just a second. The first line there. <clears throat> people who live in fear will be strengthened by those who live without it. People who live in fear. <clears throat> I, 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 I'll be honest, I was, in this, I was fascinated last night. I, literally, I spent eight hours watching election coverage last night. L literally. I counted it up. I thought, there's no way. I spent, I spent eight hours. I, I come in, I went to go get some stuff. I come in, Holly said, and it was like 15 after 7. Holly said, I paused the TV. We start to carry. It may have been a few. She said, "I pause the TV for you so we can watch." Ah, oh, that's great. So we sit down, started watching, and the commercials, couple commercials. We we got because one time it's like they should be calling. So wait, we're 15 minutes behind, and so we you know we would kind of move forward a little bit because they were talking, you know, because they know everything, and so they were talking, and we move forward. And I remember, and after a while, Holly's like, "I'm sleepy. I gotta go to bed. I gotta go." I was like, "Okay, that's fine." She goes, "Let me know." And so she went up to the bed. And, and she was up there, and I was watching. And at some point, I'm standing there like this because I have no idea what's going on. I'm completely fascinated by it. And I'm fascinated that those who are in the know did not know. That's, that fascinated me. That was, un that was unbelievable. They're in the middle of it, and I was like, they don't. And usually they got a good idea. And I was like, they don't have a clue what's going on. Every one of them, and I would switch back and forth to the different, you know, stations, and they're like, this was that, you know, all kinds of stuff. I wanted to see who it, and so it was, it was fascinating. And so that was from 7 o'clock, and literally, I turned off the TV at 3 a.m. That's when I turned off the TV, and still laid awake for a while, because I was, I have no idea what just happened. What, what in the world? And it was just, it was the most fascinating thing I had ever seen. Um, and, and so, I don't know where I was going with that, but anyhow, oh, uh, it was fascinating, but now I get on uh, I get on Facebook and I get on Twitter and other stuff like that. And again, it's a horrible thing to do around this time of of, of the year and, and life. But I get on there, and uh, and even last night, um, something I, I understand people being upset or people being happy on either side. I understand um, the whole thing's weird, and everybody knows the whole thing's weird, and it's just all weird. 
Uh, and so, you know, some of it, uh, it's just all weird. We should just all think, this is weird. We will survive. It will be okay. This is weird. And I've been preaching about God is good and we're to bless our nation and all that kind of stuff. And we're supposed to do that. Yeah. But I've seen something that I've not seen at any other time in history, and that is fear. It's unbelievable the amount of fear. And now, and some people say, well, you don't understand. or what? And, and maybe I don't. But, but when, I, when I have looked and who I have seen that has fear, their fear is based on things that don't even really exist. They're, they're, not even, they're not even there. It's, 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 it's opinions from a thought, from a word, from another opinion about something that somebody believes. It's not that somebody said, I'm going to come after you with a hatchet, uh, and then you would rightly be afraid, but it is just, it's craziness. And so when I begin to see that, I've seen fear. And so, again, it's one of those things, whether they should have the fear or not, and there's some like, oh, you shouldn't have it, whatever. I don't understand it, but to them it's real. And so my my job, my purpose is to try to minister to those who are walking in fear, even if I think it's misplaced, even if I think it's whatever. And I see that in that, that people who live in fear will be strengthened by the people who live without it. What is Jesus, what is he doing here? Doesn't he know they're trying to kill him? What, 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 how insane is he for staying? And that's the Scott translation of what I just read there. How crazy is he for being here? <clears throat> they, they may not understand why you don't have fear. They may not understand that. But at some point, those, those who are fearful will see a lack of fear as a sign of hope. And if we as believers in God can walk in the middle of the places. Again, I told you that God gives you a brain. He's delighted with you to use it. And there's sometimes that he says, stay away from that valley because it's the valley of death and you don't really want to go there. And so there's times that he keeps you in that. But in the middle of the valley of death, God, God doesn't make you afraid. Uh, and he gives you a fork because he says, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a meal for you in the middle of this. I'm going to allow you to be able to sit down and be calm. And while the entire world, it is why that we as believers, and taking way too long in the scripture, but it's why as we as believers can stand on the scripture that says that we have a peace that passes understanding. How do you have peace? I don't know. I just do. And, and that's, that's where we get to. And when we can learn to live that out, and not get caught up in all the vitriol, not get caught up in all the stuff, and not get caught up in all the fear-mongering and the name-calling and all that kind of stuff, which is why I've tried to preach this the last few weeks. If, if we can demonstrate that we are not afraid because our God is good, not because we won or we lost, that, that our God is good, so we are not afraid. Is there danger? Yeah. But yet I'll have no fear. That will be hope to those, and we won't be able to explain it other than God. So way too much on that first part. But those who live in fear are strengthened by those who live without it. The bullet point there. When we only believe what we are told, <clears throat> we will be amazed by the ones who know who they are. When we only believe what we are told, then we will be amazed by the ones who know who they are. Jesus knew who he was. <clears throat> Jesus had something that we don't see a lot of, and, and this is not a political statement at all, uh, for years. It's, it's hard to this. Jesus had confidence without arrogance. And that's, that's a hard place to be because you've got to be. And for those who are not confident, it will sometimes look like arrogant. So you've got to be, not be afraid of being called arrogant. You've got to know your heart. and You've got to walk in confidence without arrogance. Jesus knew, knew who he was. <coughs> Jesus, um, <coughs> so, it's, uh, you know, it's... it's that next line there. What, what we know will sometimes get in the way of what is real. Probably should have put no in quotes. Put little mini quotes by that. Put finger quotes next to that. What we know will sometimes get in the way of what is real. It's the old, can any good come from Nazareth kind of thing. That's, that's where they were with this. How could it be? For we know where this guy comes from. When the Messiah comes, he'll just poof. There'll be blue flames and he'll, just, he'll come up out of nowhere. And it'll be there, and it'll be great, and the Roman government's going to be overthrown because this was their this was their thought. He's going to come, and he's going to take us, and he's going to set up a an earthly kingdom, and there's going to be a you know there's, he's going to rule and reign. <clears throat> but how could this guy be there? Can can anything good come from Nazareth, another place? But but we know his mother and father. We know who this guy is, and and we and we're not supposed to really know those kind of things. Their earthly knowledge got in the way of their spiritual knowledge. We've talked about that before. Um, 
And, and then, it's just funny, when the Messiah comes, he'll simply appear. No one will know where he comes from. This is one of those things where most don't know what they don't know. Uh, okay? Uh, they didn't realize. They, they were completely wrong prophetically. They were completely wrong from what the Scripture said about the Messiah, that he's just going to appear and no one's going to know. And the Pharisees actually answered that a little bit later in the Scripture. But sometimes people don't know what they don't know uh, because a little bit later we do know where the Messiah would come from, and they do know that. While Jesus, 28, was teaching in the temple, he called out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I come from, but I'm not here on my own. The one who sent me is true, and you don't know him. But I know him because I come from him, and he sent me to you. Then the leaders tried to arrest him. But this is hard to do because no one laid a hand on him uh, because his time had not yet come. Be, be arrested, but nobody <laughs> laid a hand on him. That's, that's not going to work. That's not going to work either time. His time had not yet come. Uh, that line there. There is always a story behind what we see on the surface that really speaks to what's happening. There's always a story behind what we see on the surface that really speaks to what is happening. Jesus is saying, yeah, I, you, know, you know what you see, but you're not seeing what's important. You're not seeing where I came from. You're not seeing who sent me. You know, sometimes, sometimes we see people, not Jesus, we see people who have a position, or we see people who have a title, we see people who have something. And we think, man, I want to get there. Why are they? They're no different than me, and it ought to be easy for me to get there. Uh, and, and the reality is we don't know their story. We don't know what they had to go through to get where they are. We don't know what they had to experience. We don't know the hard times. We don't know the struggles. We, we don't know what shaped them and formed them. There was a, <clears throat> there was a, there was a line. Uh, there was some song. I believe it was a Kirk Franklin song. And he had T.D. Jakes rapping on the Kirk Franklin song. So you can imagine how if, if Carmen was in it, it would have just taken it to the next level. It would have just it would have been absolutely incredible. And then the Happy Goodman trio or something coming in the background. I don't know, whatever, John. But anyhow, and so the idea, and one of the lines, one of the lines in the song is, you see me now, but you don't know how. And it's, it's a great line. Because it's the idea of, yeah, you look at where I am now, you see what I have now, but you don't know how I got here. You don't know the story. And there's usually a story that you see on the surface behind what's really happening. Jesus was saying, yeah, you see me, but you don't know who sent me. You don't know where I come from. And that's the important thing. Knowledge, that next line there, knowledge of your own mission and authority will allow you to move past another's perception of you. Knowledge of your own mission and authority if you don't know who you are, you don't know what you're supposed to do, and you don't know who you answer to, there's going to be a lot of other people, and their perception is going to shape you, and it's going to mold you, and it's going to direct you, and you're going to get derailed at a time. So you've got to know your own mission, and you've got to know your own authority. I know who I came from. I know that he sent me. That's what Jesus said. I, I, know, I know who my authority is. And that is God, the Father in heaven, and I know that he sent me. I know my mission here on this earth, and it doesn't really matter at some point. And the reason it didn't matter is they tried to arrest him, but they didn't lay their hands on him. Why? Because it wasn't his time that Jesus had ordered his steps. And in the middle of that, God was directing what was going on. Many among the crowds at the temple believed in him. After all, it says... Would you expect the Messiah to do more miraculous signs than this man has done? When the Pharisees... But Jesus told them, I will be with you only a little while longer. Then I will return to the one who sent me, and you will search for me, but not find me. He told his disciples that too. It just, just freaks them out. Um, and you cannot go where I'm going. They, they saw the signs. They saw the signs. That first line there, knowledge of God is very important. But a demonstration of God will make a difference. Knowledge of God is very important, but a demonstration of God. You say, well, there's got to be signs and wonders all the time. I would remind you the biggest signs and wonder <clears throat> that it was the demonstration of God's love for us that was revealed when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. That was a demonstration. It wasn't just a knowledge that God exists, but a demonstration of his love that came forth in his son. A demonstration of God will make a difference. That we've got to learn that we... 
We cannot, as a, we, we cannot just have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof. That we've got to believe that yes, the words are there and they're good and the prayers are there and they're good, but they can literally change a life. The demonstration of it is what matters. And, and, and we're convinced that just a moment in God's presence will do more than, I mean, a million sermons or a minute, million anything else. That next line there. When our lives are about us, we are threatened when our influence is challenged. They sought to arrest Jesus because he challenged the Pharisees' power. He was sticking it to the man, and the man didn't like it. And so his influence was challenged because their life was all about him. And Jesus said, my life is about the one who sent me. When you know your mission, when you know your authority, when you know who really matters, when you know that it's not about you, and that's tough because we like for it to be about us, when you know it's not about you, then we can't be challenged and we can't be threatened. I wrote a little a, a little blog thing today and, and posted on Twitter. Went out, so <clears throat> read it. It'll be life changing. Uh, but no, one of the one of the statements uh, that I may have just talked about what you know because everybody's writing their response to the election. I thought, well, I got to do that because you know whatever. Uh, but basically, it boiled down to this: What's our response? We do what's basically a mission statement that we that we love, that we serve, that we worship. That's what we do. And one of the things I put in there is that as we serve, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's easy to be a servant until you're treated like one. And then it doesn't feel so good. And then we're tempted to stop. So when it's not about us, we're not so quick to stop and give up. Uh, 35, the Jewish leaders were puzzled by this statement. Where is he planning to go, they ask. Is he thinking of leaving the country and going to the Jews in the other lands? Good question. Maybe he will even teach the Greeks. What does he mean when he says, you will search for me but not find me, and you cannot go where I'm going? Just that one line there. Our first response to the unknown is usually not a question to find out more. But it's usually a rush to fill in the blanks. Our first response to the unknown is not usually a question to find out more, but a rush to fill in the blanks. <clears throat> Notice what they did. They didn't be like, we don't know. Maybe we should press Jesus more. Because sometimes Jesus didn't just come right out and say, this is what I mean. And it was confusing to the site when chapter 6 was about that. They, they, were, they didn't get it. You know, and then he starts talking about blood and body and eating it and stuff, and they didn't get it even more. And sometimes when, when we hear things that we don't get, we don't understand, we fill in the blanks instead of questioning. Sometimes Jesus, I believe, has given us some things that we don't understand, not because he's trying to confuse us, but it's because he's, he's trying to get us to question. He's trying to get us to ask, and he's trying to get us to interact that we'll learn a little bit more if we're asking and we're engaging and it builds relationship and rapport more than him just lecturing on a board and walking away. He's more about the interaction there. But a lot of times what we do instead of questioning, we start filling in our own blanks. Well, Jesus said this, so he must mean this. We, we see it in society sometimes. Well, you believe this, so you must believe that and that as well. And we start filling in the blanks. Well, you said this, And this person over here who was like this said this same thing, so you must believe this, this, and this, or you must be this and that. And so you begin to fill in all those kind of blanks, and and, and that's that's dangerous because we start labeling people and we start getting our idea of who someone is and and, and what they're to be about. And uh, Jesus just wanted them to question. He wanted them to ask and interact with him. On the last day of the climax of the festival... Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come, or anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. 
By the way, I'm thanked for the questions that I just put into that, that response thing on the liturgy thing. So there you go. All right. Let's make sure that one is. On the last day, the climax of the festival. I know you don't care. Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone. Uh, believing in him, but the Spirit had not yet been given. He was speaking of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring that happened in, in Acts there. And because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. That line there. Jesus gives an open invitation to himself. And that line, he is the source of all that you are lacking. Jesus gives an open invitation to himself. Come to me. Anyone, listen, there's a requirement when you come to God, and it's that you're thirsty. Is, is that, that you come to the place where you realize that you're lacking, where you realize, I, I can't do this on my own. There's nothing at all that I can do here on my own. I'm thirsty and I've got no water, to put the metaphor there. And when you realize that you're thirsty, you go to Jesus because he's the one that has living water. It's the same message the woman at the well. If you knew who I was, you would ask me for the living water, and if you drank from it, you'd never thirst again. It's the idea that he's he's meeting you at your need. You're thirsty. And the requirement is that when you realize that you're lacking, you come to him. And if you do, there's an open invitation. And then that next line there, what God gives you is meant to be given out again. God's going to give you so much stuff. I'm not talking about cars and all that kind of stuff. And he may, I don't know. But God's going to give you so much of himself. And that's awesome. But guess what? He doesn't want you to just sit in your room and just kind of hug yourself and be like, ooh, that's good. You can do that for a moment. But he gives you what he gives you so that it can be given out again. He said, said, the scriptures declare rivers of living water. It says will flow from his heart. The, the, The actual passage that it comes from, it says, rivers of living water will flow from your heart. And we can get that out of here. But he was saying, look, I'm going to give you rivers of living water, and it's going to flow out of you. That's an amazing. We also get the picture of he tells us it's a cup that's overflowing, that's running over. That what we have is to be given out. The spirit that will be given you will flow from you. And when the crowds heard him say this, some of them declared, surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said he's the Messiah. Still others said he can't be. Will the Messiah come from Galilee? For the scriptures clearly state that Messiah would be born of the royal line of David in Bethlehem. See, remember, told you. (laughs) The prophecies clearly say, all right, the scriptures say from the royal line of David in Bethlehem, the village where King David was born, so the crowd was divided about him. That line there, with all the evidence in the world, there will be still some who debate the truth. The truth can be all around them, but it won't be in them. And they'll still debate the truth. It's amazing how two people can see the same thing uh, in two different ways. There's a great picture on the internet, and, and, I, and I thought about it while I was sitting over here. I thought, there's no way I've, I can get that on the screen. Um, and I've seen different ones, and, but there's one of them. It's like there's a, there's a number, and it's six from the person who's standing on this side, and there's somebody standing on the other side, and it's a nine. And it's just, it's just upside down to one. Or which one's wrong? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. It's the truth, but it's it, it's the, it's amazing how two people can see things differently, the same thing through different eyes. And perception or perspective does not determine the truth, but it determines how you see the truth. That line there. Sometimes, what you don't know will affect what you believe. Well, what you do know will affect what you believe. Sometimes what you don't know will affect what you believe. Again, Jesus was from the line of David. He had been born in Bethlehem. I mean, we sing songs about it. That's how we know. It was silent. Even though there was animals and babies crying, apparently it was silent. But anyhow, that's sarcasm. Uh, but anyhow, the, the, it, it was in Bethlehem. There was a star, the whole thing. We know that. He was from the line of David. They only knew him from Galilee. They didn't know that he fulfilled all the other things. There wasn't quite the resources we have today. And then the last couple of things here. Some even wanted him arrested. But no one laid hands on him. 
When the temple gods returned without having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and the Pharisees demanded, Why didn't you bring him in? We have never heard anyone speak like this, the guards responded. I made reference to this before, but just a moment in the presence of God will change an agenda made of man. A moment in the presence of God. We have plans, but when God shows up, plans change. And we take what God is doing. They're saying, you don't understand. There's something different about this man. That's what they were telling him. Have you been led astray too? The Pharisees mocked. Is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believes in him? This foolish crowd follows him, but they are ignorant of the law. God's curse is on them. Then Nicodemus, a leader who had met with Jesus earlier, spoke up. Is it legal to convict a man before he is given a hearing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? You one of them? Search the scriptures and see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. They just got through saying it wasn't about being from Galilee. It was from the line and from the lineage. And here's the deal. It is a common thing to believe that we are right. And that everyone who believes differently is a fool. It's extremely common. Because clearly if they're different from you, they're wrong. Most of the time... Here's what I find most of the time, I don't know if I can explain this just quickly, but most of the time we actually accuse the other of what is really our problem. David was accused by his brothers of having a, um, an arrogant, prideful heart. When he came to see them, when they were supposed to be fighting Goliath, they said, you're full of pride. You're full of arrogance. What are you doing here? I would remind you that these were the same brothers that God rejected to be king. And there is one reason that God rejects a person, and that is a prideful heart. I've been around people who have, they were sure, pastors, they were sure that someone else was trying to, quote unquote, steal their members. Sure of it. And you know why? It's because at times they had stole other people's members. If you're a certain way, sometimes you have a tendency to believe that everybody else is that way, and so you'll accuse them. there. Where there is a fight for an agenda more than the fight for the right, sounds weird, even a question will seem like the challenge of an enemy. And let just to question someone, just say, tell me more, but, but isn't this, well, and again, it's, you no, know, you've got to do it this way. Well, what if we try it this way? Are you the enemy? Are you like them? Are you against this? Do you even believe, are you a robot? Who are you? You know, whatever it is that, that they say. Nicodemus was searching for the truth. We, we even find that at Jesus' death that he plays a role. The, the idea here is that he was searching for the truth. He had had an encounter with the man Jesus, and he knew something was different. So he was searching. And then that last line there, deception and degrading will usually go hand in hand as a tool of the enemy. There's no prophet from Galilee. Man, you must be biased. What are you, from there? You have to determine that you will not be shamed away from the truth of God. 